So my name is Dana Mortensen. I'm the co-founder and executive director of World Savvy. It is really fun to be here um, in a room full of like-minded folks who all celebrate global education and are doing such important work in so many different ways. So it's, an especial, it's a special privilege to be um, moderating this panel. Um, World Savvy was founded 14 years ago to help um, embed global competence into teaching, learning, and culture, and was founded here in the Bay Area. And Mill Valley teachers were some of, among the first to be part of our programming. Um, so I'm going to let each of these individuals introduce themselves. They are superstars in their own right. But the, the, to sort of set the stage, one of the reasons I wanted to bring together this group was to sort of underscore a really important point, which is that if we subscribe to the notion that there is no silver bullet in transforming education to embed global competence, then what really becomes necessary is finding meaningful ways at all levels within the system to work together. And so this group represents a really functional team that's been able to do that. How do we look at student engagement? How do we examine teacher practice and capacity? And how do we work at the leadership level and have all of those um, working together to sort of change what the experience looks like for learners? Um, so everyone on the stage is from the Mill Valley Public School District. Um, and in various ways has been immersed in the program that we've offered. The first was a um, was formerly called the World Savvy Challenge and is now World heavy classrooms, so really engaging teachers and students in project-based learning around complex global themes and problem solving in diverse teams. And we also have a privilege to have two students on the stage, students that are the graduates of the first cohort for a, a master's level global competence certificate program that was um, jointly developed with Asia Society um, and Teachers College at Columbia University and graduated this past December. So hopefully we'll get to hear some best practice from what they learned there as well. Um, so with that, I want to ask you each to just give us a brief introduction, who you are, a little bit of your background, and what your role is within the district um, that positions you to affect change around embedding global competence. Okay, I'll start. You're stepping on the mic. <laughs> I think I got disconnected. No. Hi, my name is Anna Lazzarini, and I am the principal of Mill Valley Middle School. I uh, have been at the school. This is my 22nd year. I was a core teacher in the classroom, um, actually teaching with the, as a partner to the teacher who first introduced World Savvy Challenge, World Affairs Challenge, to the district as a club, and have watched it grow over the years, and feel privileged to be a part of this team. Um, hi, I'm Paul Johnson. I'm the superintendent of the Mill Valley School District. Um, I've been a superintendent for 15 years. My previous district in the Sacramento area, um, we opened a brand new um, international baccalaureate school. Um, and here in the Mill Valley School District, I'm just excited to support really enthusiastic teachers and administrators with uh, global studies. And, uh, and I wanted to say, too, that I hear that Edmodo is going to sponsor all of our teachers' lounges to look like this. <laughs> <laughs> Wine. <laughs> Wine and candy. Um, my name is Maggie Front, and I teach 7th grade social studies and language arts and a 6th grade class called Connections, where we help kids learn to connect to themselves, their community, and the world. And I'm also one of the GCC graduates from Columbia University, and I've been teaching, gosh, since the turn of the millennium, is that what we say? <laughs> I'm Rod Sepka, and I teach uh, seventh grade English and history at Mill Valley Middle School. And I also teach a course called Global Citizenship and Debate, uh, which um, we just started. Uh, this is our second year have, having that course at the school. I also did the GCC certificate program. And um, I started uh, this whole process working with the World Savvy Challenge as the club leader after the original person left, and uh, was so impressed with the program that I thought, why is this a club and not part of our school? So um, shared that information with uh, some of my colleagues here, and um, we wrote a grant uh, for our school to get people training in the World Savvy program. That led to some of us doing the GCC, and it all came because we had so much support from our administration, both at the building level and at the district level, um, that we were able to do that. Um, so we're really fortunate. And I'm Brandilyn Patterson. I teach math and sometimes science. And I am privileged to be a part of this three-member team uh, this year. We have started a global teacher inquiry project, so we're looking into how to scale global education at our school. 
Fantastic. Thank you all so much. I want to start kind of at the 30,000 foot level in terms of the ecosystem that we're dealing with here and think about what it means. Um, Brandon was talking about intentionality and what does it mean to start at the administrative level or even more broadly, the set of stakeholders that are interacting with the district um, in Mill Valley and to think a little bit about what it looked like to get buy-in for this kind of initiative um, and to talk generally and specifically about some of the steps you took and maybe some of the things you confronted along the way. Um, sure. Um, what we did is around four years ago, we uh, went through a process where we interviewed uh, community members. We had about 18 focus groups, um, ranging from athletic coaches to high school teachers to our staff, um, uh, parents. And then we conducted extensive surveys to compile information to come up with a strategic plan and a vision. And seven key themes emerged from um, our planning, and one was around global education. Um, first, changing our vision to include uh, global citizenship, and then also uh, putting an entire strategic goal around global studies and global awareness, um, and tying that with global inquiry. And so that became the foundation of the school district. The school board bought into it. Um, the principals all helped create it. Um, Actually, Rod, you were on the, on the steering committee, and so everybody had buy into what our vision was. Because it's definitely, di it's very difficult to go global as a school system or district-wide. And one thing that has helped us is we quote the strategic plan quite a bit. And, you know, this is one of our priorities. Remember, we all put this together. Um, but it's very important that there be buy-in all the way from the school board um, through all the administrative ranks. Um, so I think that's helped us, and um, I think it's helped us to not just be in our own little independent pockets, um, and so that we're trying to work together as a team. And if I can just do a follow-up on that and ask a little bit more about maybe the role parents play or to reference something in an earlier panel, this idea of making the case. So what were the sort of things you pushed on to make the case for why including global at the district level was such an important priority? So from the parents in the, the panels were comments like Mill Valley is just in its own little bubble. Um, foreign language instruction at the elementary level and all the way up through um, the different uh, classes, um, learning to understand the world around us. Comments like that came from the parents. And then we took that. We also used uh, Tony Wagner's The Global Achievement Gap as a basis for study um, during our planning. And we used some of that. And we just designed that from the comments um, and uh, you know, put that together. Great. Thank you. Um, so now I want to move to sort of looking at um, successes and best practices and actually as an, from an administrator viewpoint in supporting a culture where teachers have time, space, opportunity, and tools to do this. Um, so sort of how did you approach that, Anna or Paul, Anna, um, so that that um, was something that teachers didn't feel um, oppressed by initiative fatigue as so often happens for teachers? What did that look like? Fortunately, these three teachers are never fatigued, no matter what the <laughs> initiative is. Um, it is it is something to consider, though, because we're in the midst of you know Common Core implementation and NGSS implementation. We're also going one to one with technology, rolling it out eighth grade this year, seventh next year, and sixth grade. So we have several things going on, but this was really important to us. As it is, as Paul mentioned, part of our strategic plan, and we had a, have a lot of support from the community. We have a great board and a great community who really values education in, in high levels. And, um, you know, Rod and Maggie and Brandilyn are able to create things and creating a, a team that works with the same 120 kids um, and doing an interdisciplinary social studies, English, and math. Um, you know, it, it was a little bit of work to create a master schedule that provided them all with the same prep period and the same number of the same exact students, um, but it has been quite worth it, and um, it has been something that we. It, it's been interesting and, and incredibly um, satisfying to see the kids develop the projects that these teachers have created with them, and um, to just even be in the classroom hearing 
the different conversations and the level of the conversations um, about like equity of education depending on where you live. I mean, this, this is a lunchtime conversation I'm hearing kids talk about, and I'm like, these are seventh graders, and you know, three years ago they would not have been having this conversation during rainy day lunch. Um, so it has been. Yes, it's work on all of our parts. It's been a ton of work on their part because you know one prep period four times a week for an hour does not create the program they have implemented. And so it takes a lot more work on their part and they are dedicated and committed to making this a success, which makes my job easier. So let's talk about that commitment <laughs> and talk about from your perspective, maybe a little bit more detail on how you've actually structured this interdisciplinary collaboration. We've heard a lot about how much peer support and leaning on other teachers and the time and opportunity to talk with other teachers is, is critical. Maybe you can describe what that actually looks like um, for you all as an interdisciplinary team and how you work to put that together and, and connect. Well, it starts with a, um, a whiteboard or a very large piece of butcher paper and a lot of markers and just huge brainstorming sessions last summer trying to come up with, well, we knew what our inquiry question was, but what were the things that were important to us? What did we need to peel off? What did we need to um, blend together? And how, how could we take math, which in our minds I think was probably the most difficult subject to integrate, and really make that part of what we were doing? I think it also came from, you know, we're integrating content, but we're also integrating common systems and a common way of looking at things. So sometimes we have cross-curricular projects that really do take the math into core, take the writing into math, but other times it's more about having a growth mindset and fostering that in all of our students through all of their classes, or teaching them to see things from different perspectives, or to what, honor what other students are saying. So it goes further than just, just the actual content, there's also that other layer of all those other things that sometimes are discounted, but that are equally important. I think um, for us, one of the, the big things is a shift in uh, what we see our job is as an educator in the classroom. Um, instead of looking at the narrow scope of the, the specific content, um, as people in our earlier panel spoke about, um, information is at your fingertips. Uh, it was looking at broad themes and uh, big ideas that we wanted the kids to be able to take away with them, and then uh, designing a curriculum that was relevant and about the real world that would then link back to the content. So starting with what was important first and then working towards the other aspects of it. And I want to build off that and ask a question. I think Esther brought it up earlier about this idea of moving from kind of sage on the stage to guide on the side. or um, And because this really represents, teaching for global competence represents a pretty significant shift in teaching practice, right? Um, when I was in middle school, it was sage on the stage. The content that was delivered was pretty much what I knew if I didn't get something different at the public library. So your focused work on rethinking that and, and looking at your own practice pretty deeply and taking steps to, to change it to accommodate this kind of learning. Tell us a little bit about that journey um, and what how your practice has actually changed to accommodate this. Um, well, for me, it's my the change in my practice has been transformative. and. I'm working really hard to be a mentor with my students rather than their teacher. And it, that seems like semantics, but it's really not. It really is very, very different. It means getting down with them often, um, letting them, or I shouldn't say letting them, they are the expert in a lot of things, learning from them, and creating a climate where we're all learning together. And it's really hard to set aside you know, 50 years of what I've known as, as what it means to be a learner. But it's, I'm seeing a lot in my students. I'm seeing them step up. I'm seeing them be more respectful. I'm seeing them value their own voice, which I think is really important. Well, the, the, the obvious sh short answer is that assuming you have an hour period, which sometimes you have a little bit less than that, I spend no more than 10 minutes talking, which for me not to talk for more than 10 minutes, if you know me, <laughs> is pretty much a feat on my part. But you know, the students don't need me to give them information. That's what Siri's for. They all just ask Siri. What they need is to figure out how do I reflect upon this information? How do I synthesize it? What do I do with it? 
and that's kind of the focus. And once again, it's, it's a big shift and it's easy to fall back into those old patterns, especially when you're pressed for time. But developing those relationships with students, utilizing technology so that you can individualize instruction, giving them a voice and a choice. So at the end, you are going to need to present this. How you do it is up to you. iMovie, slides, web page. You decide, and actually, guys, I don't know how to use any of these, so you have to figure it out on your own and teach your neighbor, and then come to me and show me when it's done, and we'll talk about the thought that went into it. At the same time, I think it's not, um, it's not to say that as a teacher you don't lay the groundwork, um, that that is still incredibly important, but the way um, in which you deliver the information um, and set the stage is a lot different. So um, we spent a lot of time developing cooperative groups, talking about how you work together with others, um, planting the seeds, uh, directing them to the right sources, um, helping them make decisions about what is reliable and what isn't. Um, and um, those kinds of things uh, take a lot of time. And being really clear what our intention is going into any kind of a project. I think uh, one of the ways in which we shifted is um, project-based learning and inquiry has been around for decades, but in the last 15 years, it sort of disappeared completely uh, from schools in general, not necessarily from individual classrooms or teachers, but it sort of was no longer important. And I think um, World Savvy did a great service in keeping it sort of at the forefront uh, of what they did and the way in which they um, wanted teachers to be interacting with their students. And I think we all benefited from being reintroduced to that kind of teaching and learning um, that has affected the way in which we do what we do. Yeah, please. What, what they're describing is what all teachers should be doing, especially with the new Common Core standards and the NGSS standards. It should be inquiry-based, it should be student-led, it should be problem-solving rather than giving information. And so uh, Brandilyn, Rod, and Maggie are model teachers in, in their ability to embrace that and to make that happen for their kids. And it really has made an impact on the students and the families. They have done when they did a, the project about water, they had all the families come in and the kids had to share it with their parents and they had this big exhibition in the library and as the parents were leaving, they were just floored at the depth of level of knowledge that their kids had and the solutions that they had come up with to, uh, you know, to fix the problem that they had found in the water system. And so I think that this is, you know, this is great stuff that's going on. Yeah, no question. So just in, let's focus a little bit on the student experience. You know, between you, you have uh, more than 30 years of teaching experience, or on the stage, more than 50 or 60. I don't know. I don't want to tack on too many years. A lot of teaching experience, suffice to say. So just thinking about over this, the progression for yourselves, as your teaching practices change, as you've seen the environment change, what is the student experience? How does it look different? You know, and, and how does it sound different? And, and what about the environment more broadly feels feels like there's been a change in what it feels to be like a learner um, in the school system. And it, specific examples are great too if you've got them. I think one thing that's really different is um, kids see themselves as actors, that they're in school to learn something so they can take action and not just um, receive information from the teacher. And I think that for me is really different too. The kids see themselves as um, purposeful and they bug Anna, <laughs> a lot about changes they want to make in the school um, because they feel like they have a voice. Um, they see things um, that they're learning about and they're being much more uh, inclined to think about what they can do to solve the problem. And one example of this is we, we started the year talking about water. That was going to be our big thing because of the drought. Uh, we had no idea that Flint would come along. Um, and uh, many other things uh, concerning water in the past year. And so the students, we, we've done a lot of work around that, and um, after several weeks of talking about the Flint crisis, them looking at um, it in their math class and the English class, we looked at some images on the screen, and one of the students 
after looking at the images for a few moments, said, wait a second, is this about race? Because the images and the photos of the community are a more racially diverse group than what we have in Mill Valley. And that was a catalyst for that student to say, this is an equity issue. Um, it goes beyond a water crisis. Let's do something. And she started working together with other students to try to figure out a way to raise money and to do something um, to address that problem. And she went from there, being a student not so engaged, to then thinking about um, just being a girl in our own school and what that means. And now she's working on a project to share that with other classes and students in the school. And I think building on that, it's also motivated her, like many of my other students, to become a self-directed <coughs> learner. She's realized that this is really important, and if I don't start taking, you know, looking at myself and taking the initiative and learning some of this and thinking about some of this, I'm kind of going to be left behind. And so she's really stepped up. She's started doing her assignments, turning in her assignments, and we have a lot of students who all of a sudden they feel this connection and they realize that, you know, this is, this is the time for me for me to step up and I'm in control of my own destiny. And this is what I'm gonna do. This is how I'm gonna make the world better. This is how I'm going to learn for myself. And they just take off. Yeah, it's been really fun to see. Right now, um, my class is in the middle, actually yours is too, Rod, of, of um, doing projects where they're looking at a, a problem at the global level, um, regional level, and the local level. And then they're trying to solve it at the local level with something that a 12 or 13 year old can really do. And it's been fun to watch the process. Um, for example, I have this group of four boys and they are very rowdy and hard to kind of corral. And they started out with, with looking at the condition in the, around the world in prisons. They had heard about Guantanamo Bay and I think they really just wanted to watch the prison videos on YouTube. So they start watching these videos and making all these great notes and having these questions and then kind of are starting to think about that requirement where they have to do something as a, you know, in their own community and it's like, okay, maybe prisons, that's not going to work. I don't know what I can do. And then they went from there to looking about the school to prison pipeline because, well, that has something to do with schools and I'm in school. And again, they, they felt a little overwhelmed but, with that, but, but they learned about it. So now they've learned about the condition of in prisons internationally, you know, in the United States. They've learned about this idea of the um, school to prison pipeline. Then they got into restorative justice and thinking that could be a solution. Well, one of the, the boys in the group was, he works with the restorative justice at our school. And he says, you know, we're kind of already doing that. So if we do something there, that's already being done. So what they decided was, okay, we're going to make it so kids in our school don't get in trouble. That'll be good. That'll be something we can all use. And the way they're not going to get in trouble is if they love coming to school. So their solution and is, and again, remembering these are 12-year-olds, is that um, they want to reimagine school. And they're redesigning it from the ground up. The you know, fly on the wall here was really enjoying the part about the food trucks at lunch. But they also were talking about you know, flexible classes, and they were getting into some of the current research on um, adolescence and sleep. And so they're really seeing how complex everything is and how interconnected everything is. Okay. That was making me think about um, the perspective of the students. And um, we tend to all believe that we understand our community pretty well. And um, we were talking about, in my global citizenship class, we were talking and looking at um, gun violence and um, Obama's um, uh, speech and what he said about uh, gun violence and his proposals and plans. And the kids really felt like in Mill Valley there is one perspective about guns. Um, but they weren't sure. So two of the student, three of the students went out into the community with a video camera and they did a documentary. They set themselves up downtown Mill Valley, and they interviewed people across a huge spectrum of um, Mill Valley residents. They must have interviewed like 60-some people. And then they, they cut this, um, these interviews down into a, about a 15-minute video where they, they started with some of their research, and then they 
cut to what people in the community had to say, and the diversity of, of opinions was huge. And then when they shared the video with the class, we were able to have a discussion about just what is our community? What are the other perspectives that are present around us? And what does that say about the complexity of the issues that we're facing? Great, thank you so much. Um, so you're a highly functional team of teachers and administrators, I have to say. <clears throat> which is um, wonderful, but not always the norm, right? It's some, th these things are challenging. It's hard to work together sometimes. And one of the things about global competence is it's hard to teach for it if you're not modeling it, right? It's hard to teach collaboration if you're not great at collaborating. So in thinking about um, just how you've managed to do this together, sort of as a larger system, and thinking about those districts and schools that want to go global and set on that path wherever it is they're entering that journey, what are some of the most salient lessons, best practices, things that you would sort of pass on as this was really a crucial thing to think about to make this work um, from your perspective and your role? Well, my observation is the things that the World Savvy teachers are doing is the highest level of instruction possible and the highest level of student learning. Uh, because uh, inquiry is the highest level of teaching. And when students are coming up with their own problems, and then producing their own solutions uh, to those problems, that's like fun teaching. That's very stimulating. Um, it's what you talked about where the, where the teacher becomes the facilitator in the class. Um, and so I think for some school systems, it's just going back to what is really good teaching. And really good teaching is inquiry-based instruction um, to guide students. And I think just going back to that, it's using that as the foundation, and then uh, what has become of it is that the globe is the stage. And then uh, our teachers, uh, uh, Maggie and Rod, went to Ecuador because they you know, jumped up onto that stage, and there's that whole, which is really magnificent with um, how that happened. But I, to, to me, it's just going back to good teaching and then remembering that the world is the stage for information. Uh, for students. I agree with all of that and I'd like to just add that you know you also at least in our my experience and in our district it always works better when it grows from the teachers and so this came from you know Rod doing World Affairs Challenge with Judy for a couple of years and then seeing the opportunities and World Savvy then creating curriculum instead of just doing the challenge and you know it grew to Maggie, and then it grew to six seventh grade core teachers, and then it has grown to sixth grade teachers and eighth grade teachers. So in a matter of three years, we've had 10 of the 18 core teachers we have trained in World Savvy who are now implementing and infusing parts of it into their regular curriculum. And so I think that when you get when you grow it from the teachers, the excitement that comes from what they're doing and others seeing what they're doing is what creates more interest in advancing that. I think that for our school district, that works much better than if it's a top-down thing. Success breeds success. Yeah. I was going to say, we model a lot for our students, and we're pretty open about it. So our three classrooms happen to be side by side, and we're always in and out of each other's classrooms and we're asking for clarification, we're asking questions, we try to come observe each other when we can, even if it's only five, ten minutes. We're very open with our students about, we met yesterday, your three teachers met yesterday, this is what we decided, this is where we would like to try, what's your feedback, what's your input? So we're getting input from them, we're letting them know that this is new, letting them know this is important, and then once again we model, hey, we need planning time, just like you need collaborative time, we need collaborative time and that's why we're going to be out tomorrow. Or that's why our door's closed at lunch and we can't meet with you today because the three of us have to talk because we really want to make this work, but that means we've got to focus right now. And um, I think students have been impressed by that. I'd like to say at least they've been, or they've been shocked. They've been, you know, they're taking it. Oh, you actually talk to each other. <laughs> yes, we do. And sometimes it's about you, but sometimes it's about other things. But, you know, that's kind of a, a shocking revelation for a middle school student is that, oh, your teachers talk. Yes, we do. And um, they seem to also appreciate that. You know, hey, you've got a, a big assignment due, so there's going to be less in this class. So I think they're really feeling the, the yeah, they're, they're, they're feeling our community as well as their community. 
And, and just to add to what Anna said about um, it growing from teachers forward, um, I think the two things that really made it possible for us is that we feel safe to take risks and fail because we know that our administration is going to support us. And I think you need that, just as kids need to be in a safe environment to learn, teachers need to feel that they're going to be able to try some stuff. Um, and the other thing is um, that, and with that then comes the ability to take a risk because this is very risky because we don't know where it's going to go and it might just totally fail. Um, and so you have to just jump in and do it without really knowing exactly where you might end up. So those two things, I think, go hand in hand. And I think probably, since you took all my points, um, <laughs> the um, seeing, seeing setbacks or failures or pushback, seeing those as opportunities is really big. And, and again, the support ne network is key. Um, we were kind of in a funk for a couple of weeks, and one day Brandon walks in, and she's like, oh, we're not doing that growth mindset thing we keep telling the kids they have to do. And she was right. You know, we were really stuck in this way of, of we were so tied to the result we wanted that we couldn't be flexible. And just being there and supporting each other and helping each other grow, I think, has been huge. That's fantastic. And we've run over our time, actually. Well, not not over. A lot of great things to say. But if we want time for a Q&A and some questions, and just to congratulate you guys again on your tremendous work. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah? Can you scream or? Is that one working? Oh, it was working. Hi, everybody. Um, some educators say says that in the future technology will take us to have um, uh, like the teacher the, the the figure of the teacher more as a mentor and uh, to teach kids to gather information because informations are all over internet right so uh, like what are your thoughts about this first of all and second for for administrators. Um, would you prefer to have kids that come out of, of your school with a good pack of information or with the ability to gather and look for information and to use tools to gather those information that they need? Okay, I'll take it. Um, I think that in the, in the future, I would be delighted if, if um, students had mentors and if they were able to go in and harvest the information, I think developmentally they still need guidance in how to ask the right questions, how to evaluate um, their sources, how to be able to apply what they want to say to their audience. So I think there's always going to be the room for that, that mentor teacher, um, whatever we want to call that person. But I would like to see more of that, the responsibility for the, the hunting and gathering of information really become the venue of the, of the student, where so that they can come to an adult or to someone else and say, help me learn from this. As an administrator, I would much prefer to know that our kids are problem solvers and resourceful in finding information than just feeding them information. That is just not the way the world works anymore. And even when looking to hiring teachers, you know, I, I want to have teachers who are resourceful, not teachers who can just talk the talk. I would say photo math solves all of the math problems you have, but if you can't ask the question for photo math to solve, you're in a lot of trouble. So I think, you know, like I said, teaching role is shifting but it's still an important role, and there's still there's there's guidance, there's mentorship, there's still quite a bit of it that goes into it. That would have ended right. <laughs> yes. The suspense really builds up. The quality of the question has to follow. <laughs> right. Hopefully, that the suspense will be good enough. But um, so, thank you first of all for all of you for being here. Uh, how do you think about students helping other students and the peer-to-peer -peer element of how does it supplement what teachers do or 
from a principal administrative's point of view or even a teacher's point of view? I'll go. Um, well, first of all, students need to learn collaboration skills because that is the marketplace now, as witnessed by this open floor plan on the other side of the building. And so um, one of our goals is to help students be able to work in teams, collaborate, uh, learn different perspectives from one another um, in their research and their uh, interactions. Um, yeah, I mean, that's extremely important. I think um, as a teacher, modeling that we're learners too is, is really essential. And it, uh, I had the opportunity this year because I teach a combined seventh, eighth grade class and the eighth graders have one-on-one -on -one iPads the seventh graders don't. The kids in the eighth grade class are really much more expert at it than I am. They were able to do something, the eighth graders were able to share with the rest of the class great apps, great things that they were able to do, and they were able to show me how to make these things work in the classroom. So it became an environment where the playing field was fairly equal in terms of everybody learning from everybody else. And um, I think that the We've had some really great opportunities um, for the kids to see that people bring different strengths to the table. And if we design our lessons and our inquiries in the, the right way, you can have a very diverse group of students working together and they can celebrate the strengths of everyone. Rod, I saw you facilitate a student-led Socratic seminar too, which was totally fascinating to watch, having been on the, well, that's great. Any other questions for the panel? Yeah. Hi, my name is Kim Jacobson, um, and I'm with the Full Circle Fund and the iZone here in San Mateo County. And I don't know if this is more of a question for you or, or for you guys, but you said you'd moved from a challenge-based model to a global curriculum. And I'm curious kind of what the difference is and why did that enable you to switch from it being a club to a, yeah. a class? Or is that kind of, how did that work? Actually, more of a branding issue. It just used to be called the World Affairs Challenge and is now called World Savvy Classroom. So it's, it's always been a project-based learning model that's problem-based, challenge-based learning. Um, so that hasn't changed very much. And a lot of the curriculum that's developed around that is really a credit to the, to the teachers. I don't know if you want to jump in on that. But. Then maybe how does it work as teachers teaching a curriculum that comes from somebody else? How does that work in what, what is the curriculum part of it? Huh. So um, the, the uh, World Savvy um, organization um, has chosen themes over the years for kids to design inquiry projects based on. So for a period of a few years, it was sustainability, which is wide open across um, all content and subject areas. They worked with um, educators to develop curriculum that they could share with teachers around these broad ideas um, with resources uh, connected to it. And then it becomes just another tool for the teachers to access, um, to think about these broad ideas. I don't know if that answers your question or not. But I think one thing that happened when it went from the, um, the branding of a challenge to more of a classroom product was that it felt more accessible to teachers because it didn't feel like a competition of some kind that they were having to enter their students in. That's, that's true. I think before, my, before I actually joined into this um, part of the World Savvy Challenge was the kids took a test on their global knowledge, I think, yeah. in the beginning years of this program. And um, it's evolved from that to um, last year's World Savvy event. The kids were part of a global community sharing with one another, listening to inspiring speakers, sitting in roundtable discussion groups with kids from schools across the Bay Area, um, thrilled and excited to be there, and the competition component of it was sort of on the side, you know, a nice icing on the cake, because kids do like to compete. I mean, that's a fun part of it, too. And as an outside agency, just thinking about that partnership, I think one of the ways we see our role is to help to be thought partners with really skilled and talented teachers to bring resources there, but to help give them sort of time and energy and frameworks that let them build their own curriculum that works. Um, so we don't frame ourselves necessarily as curriculum developers, but as thought partners in that space. So a lot of what they've created has really been teachers running with it and then us finding opportunities to share it. Was another question, yeah. So thinking very tactically from, um, it sounds like the school board and the superintendent was very much behind this, but 
but from um, you three teachers, how did you actually come together? Was were you selected? Did you self-select? I mean, so think, um, you know, in other school districts, um, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about the Palo Alto school district. How might you suggest to them that they can start to implement something like this? Well, we go back a little ways. We have some history, so we just kind of talk and we're kind of we're like-minded and we share ideas and we get excited and it's about a what if this and what if that and what if that. And then if we happen to bump into Brandilyn in the hall, she's really that way. <laughs> and you get the three of us together and we're a dangerous mix. So it's kind of a it was very organic. I don't know I don't know if, how it would have worked if it had been very deliberate. Well, I think well, there's there are several things that we have in place as a district. One of the things that we do have is we have these strategic we have the strategic plan that is really clear and really specific and really targeted to global education. And that is a district-wide um, belief system and value. And then on top of it, we were able to get some funding for strategic grants that teachers could apply for. And those grants were teachers could apply for any kind of a grant that might support the strategic plan. Then you get like-minded teachers together who sit down and think about what can we do to get some of that cash, right? <laughs> um, and so, because you want to do things in your classroom. And so that's kind of, you know, where the, the support system was in place for us to do that um, and to work together to collaborate. And one thing I just wanted to add, the, the work that we do, we do, we work with districts across the country and two of the larger urban districts are Minneapolis um, and St. Paul and Oakland Unified as well. And when they started the process, um, one of the districts decided to be relatively top down. You know, it was sort of required for every ninth grade teacher to step into this. And it took three months to basically um, not be the enemy in that partnership um, because teachers weren't tapped in enough from the beginning. In the other places, the district had high level buy-in, but then allowed um, teachers to self-select to join an inaugural cohort and created time and space for that inaugural cohort to begin to see what kind of results would develop if they had this opportunity um, with some of these support system. So that mix worked really well to get the kind of energy that seems organic here um, to be sort of systemically applied in a, in a large urban district. Um, because, you know, any teacher will tell you when it's jammed down your throat, it, it doesn't, doesn't really work. So I, I just wanted to mention, too, that our foundation gave $25,000 to the school district and said, do what you want to do. And so we turned those into teacher grants. And I believe that the World Savvy was like an $8,000 grant um, that was funded. And also, it's been the community as well. So the Rotary Club, after Rod made a presentation to the Rotary Club, they got so excited that they raised the money for the air travel to Ecuador. Um, and uh, so it's just, it, it, I think it's just planting seeds and letting them spread and supporting growth. And, and, and I think for a district that might not have those um, financial resources. A couple of things to keep in mind is that whenever you have a great idea, um, don't keep it under a bushel. Let it shine, but do it in a way that's not threatening. So with the World Savvy, we started just having World Savvy days in the library, and the kids would put up projects, and then we would invite classes to come and see what they were doing. And over time, that got other people interested in, how did your kids do these projects? What is this about? Um, and then that, that's what drew some other teachers in to going to the World Savvy workshops and challenges. And now we have many teachers in our school doing different levels of projects around this same idea. And then the second thing is the parent community. Uh, kids go home and talk about what they're learning in school with the parents, and the parents get really excited about that. And then the parents want to hear more about it and see more about it. And um, that then helps build momentum around these projects too. So those might be two things that are not financially based. I think we might be at time, is that right? So you have time to mingle or past time, but I just wanna give a huge round of applause to everyone on the stage. This is a phenomenal group of educators and leaders and really appreciate it. Um, thank you very much.